concerns about the ability to vet people coming from areas where we have no relationship on the ground with the government there. Uh, and so I suppose it's possible to do it reasonably. There's a number of tools you could bring to bear, but uh, there are always risks associated with that. I mean, how do you do it? You can't call, you can't call the uh, Chamber of Commerce in Syria. How do you do it? Well, you, and we do it now, we query the holdings of the entire American intelligence community to see if any, what we call selectors, phone numbers, emails, addresses associated with that person have ever shown up anywhere in the world mm. in our holdings. That's a pretty good way to do it. Uh, getting into the person's social media to see what they have there yes, sir. is another pretty good way to do it. The way we rely on, uh, in most cases, is the host government will have information about them. Yes, and and even where the host I'm government... looking up my article here. Go ahead. Yeah. And in Iraq, uh, we had a United States military presence for many years and collected a whole lot of biometrics. So we can query that to see if the person's fingerprints ever showed up. Uh, can I stop you for one yeah, moment? I got 10 seconds. Sure, I'm sorry. How about Yemen? Similarly difficult. I yield back my three seconds, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Arono. Thank you. Back. Mm. Uh, you've been getting a, a lot of uh, questions uh, surrounding your decision to, uh, to uh, make certain statements about the investigation into Secretary Clinton's emails. And um, uh, to many of us, you treated the investigation of the Clinton email investigation, or matter, whatever you want to call it, differently than how you treated the ongoing investigation of the Trump campaign and the Russian attempts to interfere with their elections. And while you've, um, if I can understand correctly, that there's a, uh, you felt free to speak about the Clinton investigation because it had been completed when you had your press conference in July. Correct. 2016. Um, and you do confirm that, that there is still an ongoing investigation of the uh, Trump uh, campaign and their uh, uh, conduct with regard to, uh, to Russian efforts to uh, undermine our elections? We're conducting an investigation to understand whether there was any coordination between Ru the Russian efforts and anybody associated with the Trump campaign. So since you've already uh, confirmed that such an investigation is ongoing, can you tell us more about what constitutes that investigation? No. In July of 2016, when you announced that uh, you were not going to be br bringing criminal charges against Secretary Clinton because uh, you did need to show intent and there was no intent discovered, you, ha you, you spoke for 15 minutes. And not only did you say that you were not going to uh, bring criminal charges against her, by the way, which you said at the end of your 15 minutes, but you uh, went on to chastise her, saying that she had been extremely careless you raised questions about her judgment. You contradicted statements she had made about her email uh, practices and said that possibly that uh, hostile foreign agents or governments had gained access to her server and that had she still been employed by the government, she could have faced disciplinary action for what she did. I just wanted to, you know, whether when you made all those Public, the, the public statements chastising her, which amounts to editorializing on your decision not to um, uh, bring about criminal charges. It had to occur to you that this public chastisement put uh, Secretary Clinton in a negative light. So did you consider whether this public chastisement might affect the, her campaign? I have to respectfully disagree with your characterization of my intention as chastising or editorializing. My goal was to say what is true. What did we do? What did we find? What do we think about it? And I tried to be as complete and fair as I could be and tell the truth about what we found and what we think about it and what we're recommending. So when you said that she was uh, behaving in an extremely, what was it, extremely careless, can you cite me to other examples where you made some, those kinds of um, comments? that elaborated on an FBI's decision not to bring about criminal charges? I can't as director. I know the department has in the uh, IRS email investigation. They wrote a report after they were done chastising Lois Lerner, I think the woman's name was, for her behavior in a similar way. And so it happens. It's very unusual, but it happens. But uh, we know that you were very concerned about what might happen if it came to light that you had uh, possibly 
gone easy, uh, Mrs. Clinton, and uh, therefore um, that, that, that you were concerned about the political ramifications of your decisions, and yet... Uh, I was not. So you did not consider that your statements about a person who was running for president would not have a negative effect on her? I tried very hard not to consider what effect it might have politically. I tried very hard to credibly complete an investigation that had gotten extraordinary public attention and my judgment, and people can disagree about this, was that offering as much transparency as possible about what we did, what we found, and what we think of it was the best way to credibly complete the investigation. I wasn't thinking about what effect it might have on a political campaign. I find that very hard to, um, uh, uh, to really, you know, I, I, I find that hard to believe that you did not uh, contemplate that there would be political ramifications to your comments. Oh, and I knew there I'm would just be, wondering why you... I knew there you... would be ramifications. I just tried not to care about them. I knew there'd be a huge storm that would come, but I tried to say, what is the right thing to do in this case? Yes, you're right. The right thing would have been that you did not have enough evidence to bring about criminal charges, and that should have been the end of it, I would think. I don't understand why you chose to go forward with all kinds of uh, characterizations about her actions. I, that I find hard to believe, and that uh, you would not have considered the political ramifications or that it did not. You may not have considered it, but the thought should have occurred to you, and that uh, I would think that you would have bent over backwards not to, to say anything that would have an impact on the campaign or on the election because you seem to do that, that that was a concern for you. Let me turn to the Trump administration's vetting and security clearances and that process. In recent days, there have been numerous reports of Trump administration officials failing to disclose foreign contacts in their security clearance forms. What is the role of the FBI in vetting the security clearances of White House personnel, if any? Well, sometimes the FBI is assigned to do the background checks on people who are coming into government uh, in the executive office of the president. Other times not. A lot of times they're people who are arriving with clearances that already exist. So in the case of the Trump administration officials, and there have been a number of them, was the FBI asked to uh, participate in the vetting process? The FBI has done background checks for some appointees in the Trump administration. Can you disclose who these appointees were or are? I, I can't. I'm not comfortable sitting right here. I don't know them for sure, but I shouldn't talk about individuals in an open forum, at least without thinking about it better. What would be the consequences for a White House staffer or personnel who fails to disclose their foreign contacts on a security clearance form? Well, hard to say. It could include losing your clearances. If conduct is intentional, it could subject someone to criminal liability. And is that something that the Department of Justice would investigate and pursue? Potentially. Uh, it, I think it would depend upon who owned the clearance as well. In the first instance, it might be another part of the intelligence community. So since there have been these concerns raised about uh, the clearances uh, not being appropriately vetted, uh, is there an ongoing FBI investigation? into what happened with the vetting process and whether any crimes may have been committed? It's not something I can comment on sitting here. Senator Cruz. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director Comey, welcome. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your testimony. Um, you know, I have to say I found your answer to, to Senator Kennedy a few minutes ago puzzling uh, in, in that you described the reason why uh, the case was closed against Miss Abedin as that you could not determine she was aware her conduct was unlawful. And the reason that answer is puzzling is, is you're a very accomplished lawyer, and, and as you're well aware, uh, every first-year law student learns in criminal law that ignorance of the law is no excuse, and that mens rea does not require knowledge that conduct is unlawful. And, and in fact, the governing statutes, 18 U.S.C. 793F and 18 U.S.C. 798F, uh, 798A, have no requirement of a knowledge of unlawful. 798A provides whoever knowingly and willfully communicates, furnishes, transmits, or otherwise makes available to an, unauth an unauthorized person classified information shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both. Uh, under the terms of that statute, the fact pattern you described in this hearing seems to fit that statute directly. 
in that, if I understand you correctly, you said Ms. Aberdeen forwarded hundreds or thousands of classified emails to her husband on a non-government, non-classified comp uh, computer. How is... How does that conduct not directly violate that statute? First, Senator, I, 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 if I said that I misspoke, she forwarded hundreds and thousands of emails, some of which contain classified information. Uh, in the, uh, for generations, generations I think is a fair way to say it, uh, the Department of Justice has understood that statute to require, in practice, and I believe they think in law, to require a general sense of criminal intent. That is not a specific intent, but a general criminal intent, a, a sense, a knowledge that what you're doing is unlawful, not violating a particular statute, but some general criminal mens rea. I can't find a case that's been brought in the last 50 years based on negligence, based on without some showing or indicia of intent. Uh, you and I have both worked in a number of jobs that require dealing with classified information. Uh, and on its face, anyone dealing with classified information should know that that conduct is impermissible. Let me ask you, how would you handle an FBI agent who forwarded thousands of classified emails to his or her spouse on a non-government computer? Well, there'd be significant administrative discipline. I'm highly confident they wouldn't be prosecuted. I'm also highly confident there would be discipline. All right, let's, let's sh shift to another topic. Um, in the previous Congress, I, I chaired a hearing on, on the willful blindness of the Obama administration to radical Islamic terrorism. We heard testimony from a whistleblower at the Department of Homeland Security that described a purge DHS had, had undergone of editing or deleting over 800 records at DHS to remove references to radical Islam to the Mus Muslim Brotherhood. And, and the purge indeed was the word used by the White House that directed DHS to conduct that purge. Um, we obviously have a new administration now, a new White House, a new Attorney General. Uh, has the approach of the FBI to radical Islamic terrorism changed in any respect with the new administration? Not that I'm aware of, no. Let me ask you about one specific terror attack, which is on May 15th, uh, on, on May, in May of 2015, the terrorist attack in Garland, Texas, where two terrorists opened fire on a peaceful gathering. And thankfully, no innocent people were killed thanks to the heroic action of Garland police officer Greg Stevens, uh, who fatally shot the two terrorists. Uh, but a security officer was shot in the leg, and it, and it could have been much, much worse. Uh, at the time of the incident, uh, you stated publicly that the, that the FBI did not know that the terrorists were on their way to the event and that, or that they planned on attacking the event. Recently, there have been media reports suggesting otherwise, specifically media reports that have stated that an undercover FBI agent was in close communication with the two terrorists in the weeks leading up to the attack, explicitly discussed plans for the attack, uh, and was in a car directly behind the two terrorists outside the event and took photos of the terrorists moments before the attack, but then left the scene when the shooting began and, and that that agent was detained by the Garland police. Uh, are, are those media reports correct? No. I stand by what I said originally. I can't go into the details of it here because they're classified, but the, I think a fair thing to say is the media reports are highly misleading. And in a classified setting, I could explain to you how. Okay. I, I, I would appreciate you or your designee sharing those in a classified setting I'll get so, you so that, that I, I can, can learn more of what, what occurred. This committee has had substantial focus also on the practice of the previous IRS of targeting citizens and citizen groups based on their political speech, political views, and perceived political opposition to President Obama. Uh, and the previous Department of Justice, both Attorneys General Holder and Lynch, in my view, stonewalled that investigation. 
Is the FBI currently investigating the FBI's, uh, rather the IRS's, unlawful targeting of citizens for exercising political speech? Yeah, I think you're referring to the original the investigation focusing on particularly uh, groups allegedly associated with Tea Party. Yes. Uh, we completed that investigation and the department declined prosecution. We worked very hard on it, put a lot of people on it, couldn't make what we thought was a, a case, and it, to my knowledge, it has not been reopened. So did, did the FBI recommend prosecution? You said you couldn't make the no. case. No, we couldn't prove, again, the challenge of intent, we couldn't prove that anybody was targeting these folks because they were conservatives or associated with the Tea Party. We worked very hard to see if we could make that case. We couldn't get there. Thank you. Uh, Senator Blumenthal. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Director Comey, for being here. And uh, thank you to you and the men and women who work with you at the FBI for their extraordinary service to our country. Much of it unappreciated, uh, as you remarked so powerfully in your opening statement. Uh, you have confirmed, I believe, that the FBI is investigating potential ties between Trump associates and the Russian interference in the 2016 campaign, correct? Yes. And you have not, to my knowledge, ruled out anyone in the Trump campaign as potentially a target of that criminal investigation, correct? Well, I haven't said anything publicly about who we've opened investigations on. I've briefed the chair and ranking on who those people are. And so I, I, can't, I can't go beyond that in this setting. Have you ruled out anyone in the campaign that you can disclose? I don't feel comfortable answering that, Senator, because I think it puts me on a slope to talking about who we're investigating. And have, I, you, have you ruled out the President of the United States? I don't, I, I don't want people to overinterpret this answer. I'm not going to comment on anyone in particular, because that puts me down a slope of, because if I say no to that, then I have to answer uh, succeeding questions. So what we've done is brief the chair and ranking on who the U.S. persons are that we've opened investigations on. And that's, all, that's as far as we're going to go at this point. But as a former prosecutor, you know that when there's an investigation into several potentially culpable individuals, the evidence from those individuals and the investigation can lead to others, correct? Correct. We're always open-minded about, and we follow the evidence wherever it takes us. So potentially, the President of the United States could be a target of your ongoing investigation into the Trump campaign's involvement with Russian interference in our election, correct? I just worry. I, I don't want to answer that because that, that seems to me unfair speculation. Uh, we will follow the evidence. We'll try and find as much as we can, and we'll follow the evidence wherever it leads. Wouldn't this situation be ideal for the appointment of a special prosecutor, an independent counsel, in light of the fact that the Attorney General has recused himself and, so far as your answers indicate today, no one has been ruled out publicly in your ongoing investigation? I understand the reasons that you want to avoid ruling out anyone publicly, but for exactly that reason, because of the appearance of a potential conflict of interest, isn't this situation absolutely crying out for a special prosecutor? That's a judgment for the, the Deputy Attorney General, the Acting Attorney General on this matter, and, and not something I should comment on. You had some experience in this kind of decision. In 2003, you admirably appointed a special prosecutor, Patrick Fitzgerald, when the Attorney General, then uh, John Ashcroft, refused, recused himself from involvement in the investigation concerning whether the Bush administration officials illegally disclosed the identity of an undercover CIA official. Are there any differences materially between that situation and this one? so far as the reasons to appoint a special counsel? 
Well, I think both situations, as with all uh, investigations that touch on uh, people who've been actors in a political world, involve considerations of actual conflict of interest and appearance of conflict of interest. And I'm not going to talk about the current situation. In that situation, my judgment was that the credibility of the investigation into the leak of the CIA officer's identity would be best served by not having it overseen by myself because I was a political appointee and appointing someone and giving him the authority to run it separate from the political leadership of the Department of Justice. That was my judgment in that circumstance. I don't know what judgment the acting attorney general will make. I'm sure he'll consider many of the same things. Uh, Has he asked for your advice? I'm not, I'm not going to say, Senator. I wouldn't. When I was DAG, I didn't want people talking about what their conversations with me, so I'll, I'll, I'll do the same for him. So far as the investigation, the ongoing investigation into Trump associates and their potential collusion with the Russian meddling in our election, will you be providing any updates to the American people? Certainly not before the matter is concluded. And then, depending upon how the matter is concluded, I mean, some matters are concluded with criminal charges, and then there's a public accounting and a charging document. Other matters, as was the case with the email investigation, end with no charges, but some statement of some sort. Others end with no statement. I don't know yet. And obviously, I'd want to do that in close coordination with the department. Will you make recommendations to, presumably it would be the deputy attorney general or the special prosecutor, if one is appointed, as to whether criminal charges should be brought? I don't know in this case in particular, but in general, we almost always do, especially the highest profile matters. But you cannot yourself pursue criminal charges, correct? Correct. I think that's important for the American people to understand because it bears on the question of whether a special prosecutor ought to be appointed. The FBI may inspire great credibility and trust, but the FBI cannot bring charges, neither can the intelligence committees do so, nor can an independent commission, only the deputy attorney general or a special prosecutor designated by him, correct? Correct. Uh, let me uh, close because I am running out of time. Uh, have you uh, been questioned at all by the inspector general in connection with the inquiry that I understand is ongoing into a number of the topics that we've been discussing here. Yes, I've been interviewed. The Inspector General is inspecting me and looking at my conduct in the course of the email investigation, which I know this sounds like a crazy thing to say. I encourage, I want that inspection because I, I want my story told because some of it's classified, but also if I did something wrong, I want to hear that. I don't think I did, but yeah, I've been interviewed and I'm sure I'll be interviewed again. Do you have any regrets or are there any things you would do differently in connection with either the comments you made at the time you close the investigation or when you then indicated to Congress that you were, in effect, reopening it? Yeah. The honest answer is no. I've asked myself that a million times because, Lordy, has this been painful? Um, the only thing I regret is that maybe answering the phone when they called to recruit me to be FBI director when I was living happily in Connecticut. Um, <laughs> And, we would uh, welcome you back to Connecticut. Yeah, but on, I really, I can't. And I, I've gotten all kinds of rocks thrown at me, and this has been really hard. But I think I've done the right thing at each turn. I'm not on anybody's side. So hard for people to see that. But I've, look, I've asked that a million times. Should you have done this? Should you have done that? And I, actually, the honest answer, I don't mean to say an arrogant, is I wouldn't have done it any differently. Somehow I'd have prayed it away, wished it away, wished that I was on the shores of the uh, Connecticut Sound. But... Failing that, I, I don't have any regrets. Uh, I want to ask one last question unrelated to this topic uh, on the issue of gun violence. Would you agree that universal background checks would help with law enforcement and prevention of gun violence? The more able we are to keep guns out of the hands of criminals and spouse abusers and all the, the better. So the more information we have, the better for law enforcement perspective. I'll take that as a yes. Thank you. I call on Senator Tillis. Uh, yeah, I think we have one member that, if if that member is going to come back for first round, then we have three or four, maybe five of us that want a second round. 
Uh, so I hope that people will get back here so we know exactly how many people we have out of courtesy to the Senator Com or Director Comey. Senator, tell us. Director Comey, thank you for being here. I'm, I'm always impressed with your composure and your uh, preparation. And uh, I want to get to a couple of other things, uh, maybe first, then if I have time, come back to uh, what the hearing has been predominantly about. Uh, when you briefed us last year, I think that you said that there were some, that there were ongoing investigations on homeland, uh, homeland security, potential terrorists, either homegrown or uh, foreign inspired investigations in every state. Is that still the case? Yes. Do you have roughly, an, can you give me roughly an idea of the number of investigations that is? Yeah, it's just north of a thousand. Just north of a thousand. Yeah, we have that. That caseload has stayed about the same since we last talked about it. Some have closed, some have opened, but about a thousand homegrown violent extremist investigations in the United States. And do, at the time, uh, I also asked the question about uh, to what extent uh, that you can discuss in this uh, setting um, were people who are the target of those investigations, persons who came in through uh, various programs where questions about vetting have been raised as whether or not they're accurate. At the time, there were there were a dozen and a half, I think, that you may have estimated. Do you have any rough numbers about that? Yeah, I do. If you, we have about a thousand homegrown violent extremist investigations, and we probably have another thousand or so that are. I should define my terms. Homegrown violent extremists. We mean somebody. We have no indication that they're in touch any with any foreign terrorists. Touch, yeah, right. Then we have another big group of people that we're looking at who we see some contact with foreign terrorists. So you take that two thousand plus cases. About 300 of them are people who came to the United States as refugees. Okay. Um, and to what extent in all of those investigations, you mentioned earlier that there are probably about half of the uh, various computing devices that you've accessed that you can't get into with any technology that the FBI has, which I assume is some of the most advanced available. Um, to what extent is the access to that information uh, relevant in these investigations of potential homeland threats? Oh, it's a, it's a feature of all our work, but especially concerning here, because we're trying through, through lawful process figure out, are they consuming this poison on the internet and are they in touch with anybody? And so it, it's true in terrorism cases, about half the devices we can't open. About 90 some percent of our subjects are using at least one encrypted app as well that Mr. we can't read. So, Mr. Director, just because of physical and technological constraints, half of the base of information you'd like to harvest you can't get to. Uh, without 702, how much more of the remaining half would be, uh, would be harmed? Uh, well, the, the 702 actually addresses a different challenge. Yep. Losing 702 would be disastrous because it would lose our it, window. It is relevant in these investigations. However. It is. Yep. Because... That's what I mean. So half of the physical assets you can't already get access to. Then there's the metadata and all the other information that would be instructive to these investigations. So when, by going dark, do we mean 100 percent? Well, we're headed towards 100 percent. 702 is our window into the really bad guys overseas. And if we close that window, I don't know why on earth we would close that so window. So we have thousands of investigations of potential homeland security threats evenly split by either people who have self-radicalized or some who have been influenced, some who have come over in refugee programs, uh, that we will basically pull the rug out from under you in terms of being able to, to actively investigate them or uh, should say expeditiously investigate them. We'll certainly significantly impair our ability to investigate them. And that's what fo folks often say, why don't you get metadata? You can't convict somebody and incapacitate them based on medicine. You've got to drill down. The director, call me in my remaining time. I want to go back to the, uh, to the investigation. And I, I just want to give you another opportunity to maybe finish by explaining the context that you were operating in. But I want to, I want to create the context going back to when the investigation first began. It was already a part of media attention. I think on June the 27th, uh, the then Attorney General met with the spouse of someone who's subject to an active investigation, which was at, at the very least an unusual encounter, which also spun up the media. And then I think it was July 5th that you made the statement that uh, uh, I think a, a few of the things you've said that uh, I guess based on the evidence you were gathering, there was one component it was like removing a frame from a huge finished jigsaw puzzle and dumping pieces on the floor, something else that the media ties into. 
Then you said there is evidence of potential violations of statutes regarding the handling of classified information. Um, and you went on to say that under circum uh, similar circumstances, a person uh, who's engaged in these activities would likely be subject to security or administrative sanctions. I mean, that was the tough part of the statement that you made. But you went on uh, to, to say that you didn't believe a reasonable-minded prosecutor would bring a case, even though there was evidence of potential violations, and that you were expressing your view that the Justice Department should not proceed. Is that, is that typical for you to go to a point and say, I've gathered this information, there may be evidence of uh, violations, but we don't think any reasonable prosecutor in the DOJ would pursue it, therefore we're going to recommend not pursuing it? Is that common? For an FBI director to do that? Yeah. I, I've never heard of it. I never imagined but, it ever until this circumstance. When I Was there some logic in that at the time that you were making that decision based on the information that you were provided? Was there the same sort of thought process that you're going through there to have it rise to that level that then led to your October 28th notification of Congress that you had to look at other evidence that, that, that had been identified uh, on uh, Anthony Weiner's PC? Um, what I'm trying to do is say it, it looks like you were trying to provide as much transparency and as much real-time information as you had. Yeah. Uh, and then on, on November the 6th, the FBI apparently moved heaven and earth and got something done in a matter of days that they thought was going to take beyond the election. But you were in that pressure cooker. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to glue together, I think, the decision for your actions uh, on July the 5th. And, and how I think there's parallels between that and what you ultimately did on uh, October the 28th and then November the 6th. And I'll yep. yield back the remaining of my time for the answer. And I, I, I've lived my whole life caring about the credibility and the integrity of the criminal justice process, that the American people believe it to be and that it be, in fact, fair, independent, and honest. And so what I struggled with in the spring of last year was how do we credibly complete the investigation of Hillary Clinton's emails if we conclude there's no case there? The normal way to do it would be to have the Department of Justice announce it. And I struggled as we got closer to the end of it with the, a number of things that had gone on, some of which I can't talk about yet, that made me worry that the department leadership could not credibly complete the investigation and decline prosecution without grievous damage to the American people's confidence in the, in the justice system. And then the capper was, and I'm not picking on the, the Attorney General, Loretta Lynch, who I like very much, but her meeting with President Clinton on that airplane was the capper for me. And I then said, you know what? The department cannot by itself credibly end this. The best chance we have as a justice system is if I do something I never imagined before, step away from them and tell the American people, look, here's what the FBI did, here's what we found, here's what we think and that that offered us the best chance of the American people believing in the system that it was done in a credible way. That was a hard call for me to make, to call the Attorney General that morning and say, I'm about to do a press conference and I'm not gonna tell you what I'm gonna say. And I said to her, I hope someday you'll understand why I think I have to do this. But look, I wasn't loving this. I knew this would be disastrous for me personally, but I thought this is the best way to protect these institutions that we care so much about. And having done that, and then having testified repeatedly under oath, we're done, this was done in a credible way, there's no there there, that when the Anthony Weiner thing landed on me on October 27th, and there was a huge, this is what people forget, new step to be taken, we may be finding the golden missing emails that would change this case. If I were not to speak about that, it would be a disastrous, catastrophic concealment. It was an incredibly painful choice, but actually not all that hard between very bad and catastrophic. I had to tell Congress that we were taking these additional steps. I prayed to find a third door. I couldn't find it. Two actions, speak or conceal. I don't think many reasonable people would do it differently than I did, no matter what they say today. If you were standing there staring at that on October 28th, would you really conceal that? So I spoke. Again, the design was to act credibly, independently, and honestly so the American people know the system's not rigged in any way. And that's why I felt transparency was the best path in July. And then I wasn't seeking transparency in October. I sent that letter only to the chairs and rankings. Yeah, did I know they were gonna leak it? Of course, I know how Congress works, but I did not make an announcement at that point. And then you're my amazing people moved heaven and earth 
to do what was impossible, to get through those emails by working 24 hours a day and then said, honestly, sir, we found tons of new stuff, doesn't change our view. And I said, are you sure? Don't do it just because you're under pressure. They said, we're sure. We don't believe there's a case against Hillary Clinton. And I said, then, by God, I got to tell Congress that and know I'm going to get a storm at me for that. But what I can promise you all along is, I said to people, you may think we're idiots, we're honest people. We made judgments trying to do the right thing, and I believe, even with hindsight, we made the right decisions. And I'm sorry for that long answer. Uh, Director Comey, I, we have uh, seven times six is 42 minutes. Uh, I, I hope you won't want to take a break. I'm made of stone. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, on, on March the 6th, I wrote to you asking about the FBI's relationship with the author of the tr Trump Russia dossier, Christopher Steele. Most of these questions have not been answered, so I'm going to ask them now. Prior to the Bureau launching the investigation of the alleged ties between the Trump campaign and Russia, did anyone from the FBI have interactions with Mr. Steele regarding the issue? It's not a question that I can answer in this forum. As you know, I've, I've briefed you privately on this, and if there's more that's necessary, then I'd be happy to do it privately. Have, have you ever represented to a judge that the FBI had interaction with Mr. Steele, whether by name or not, regarding alleged ties between the Trump campaign and Russia prior to the Bureau launching its investigation of the matter? I have to give you the same answer, Mr. Chairman. This one I'm going to expect an answer on. Do FBI policies, just the policies, allow it to pay an outside investigator for work another source is also pay paying him for as well? Want me to repeat it? Do FBI policies allow it to pay an outside investigator for work that another source is also paying that uh, investigator for? I don't know for sure as I sit here. I, possibly is my answer, but I'll get you a precise answer. In writing? Sure. Okay. Uh, did the FBI provide any payments whatsoever to Mr. Steele related to the investigation of Trump associates? I'm back to my first, I can't answer in this forum. Was the FBI aware, was the FBI aware that Mr. Steele reportedly paid his sources, who in turn paid their subsources to make the claim in the dossier? Same answer, sir. Here's one you ought to be able to answer. Is it vital to know, is it vital to know whether or not sources have been paid in order to evaluate their credibility, and if they have been paid, doesn't that information need to be disclosed if you're relying on that information in seeking approval for investigative authority? I think in general, yes. I think it is vital to know. The FBI and the Justice Department have provi provided me material inconsistent answers in closed settings about its reported relationship with Mr. Steele Will you commit to fully answering the questions from my March 6th and April 28th letter and providing all requested documents so that we can resolve those inconsistencies even if in a closed session being necessary? Because as I sit here, I don't know all the questions that are in the letters. I, I don't want to answer that specifically, but I commit to you to giving you all the information you need to address just that challenge, because I don't believe there's any inconsistency. I think there's a misunderstanding, but in a classified setting, I'll, I'll give you what you need. Okay. Well, I hope to show you those inconsistencies. No, and I think I know what you're, you're, uh, where the confusion is, but I think in a classified okay. setting, we can straighten it out. Question, uh, next question, according to a complaint filed with the Justice Department, the company that oversaw dossier's creation was also working with a former Russian intelligence operate, operative on a pro-Russian lobbying project at the same time, the company Fusion GPS allegedly failed to register as a foreign agent for its work to undermine the Magnitsky Act which is a law that lets the president punish Russian officials who violate human rights. Before I sent you a letter about this, 
Were you aware of the complaint against Fusion was acting as an unregistered agent for Russian interest? It's not a question I can answer in this forum. You can't answer that? No. No, I can't. Uh, go on to something else. Last week, the FBI filed a declaration in court pursuant to Freedom of Information Act litigations. The FBI said that a grand jury issued subpoenas for Secretary Clinton's emails, yet you refused to tell this committee whether the FBI saw it or had been denied access to grand jury process from the Justice Department. So I think a very simple question, why does the FBI give more information to someone who files a lawsuit than to an oversight committee in the Congress? And that has happened to me several times. I'm not sure, Senator, whether that's what happened here. Uh, but you're right, I refuse to confirm in our hearings as to whether we'd used a grand jury and how. I think that's the right position because I don't know it well enough. I don't think I can tell you, I don't think I can distinguish the statements made in the FOIA case as I sit here. But, yeah. Well, just as a matter of proposition then, if, if I, Chuck Grassley, as a private citizen, file a Freedom of Information Act, and you give me more information than you'll give to Senator Chuck Grassley, how do you justify that? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't, what do I you can't... mean it's a good question? How do you justify it? What oh, I was going to say is a good question. I can't as I sit here. Ye gods. Was the Clinton investigation named Operation Mid-Year because it needed to be finished before the Democratic National Convention? If so, why the artificial deadline? If not, why was that the name? No, certainly not, because it had to be finished by a particular date. Um, there's an art and a science to how we come up with code names for cases. They, they assure me it's done randomly. Sometimes I see ones that make me smile, and so I'm not sure. But I can assure you that, that it was called Mid-Year Exam was the name of the case. I can assure you the name was not selected for any nefarious purpose or because of any timing on the investigation. Last question. When was the grand jury convened? Was it before you f your first public statement about closing the case? I'm still not in a position where I'm comfortable confirming uh, whether and how we used a grand jury in an, in an open setting. I don't know enough about what was said in the FOIA case to know whether that makes my answer silly, but I just want to be so careful about talking about grand jury matters. So I'm, I'm not going to answer that, sir. Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Director, first of all, thank you for your fortitude going through this. Appreciate it. In your testimony, you noted that the first half of the fiscal year, the FBI was unable to access the content of more than 3,000 mobile devices, even though the FBI had the legal authority to do so. Um, I'm familiar with one of those, and that is the uh, Southern California uh, terrorist attack, which uh, where, where 14 people were killed in San Bernardino. Of those 3,000 devices that you weren't able to access, can you say how many of these were related to a counterterrorism uh, event? I don't know as I sit here, Senator, but we can get you that information. Yeah, I really uh, very much appreciate that. Um, we had looked at uh, legislation that would take into consideration uh, events of national security and provide that um, devices, it, it must be some way of even going before a judge and getting a court order to be able to open a device. Do you think that would work? Well, that would sure, to my mind, be a, a better place for us to be from a public safety perspective, but we aren't there now. Um, in terms, of this week, uh, the British Parliament's Home Affairs Secret Select Committee released a report finding that social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube failed to remove extremist material posted by banned jihadist and neo-Nazi groups, even when that material was reported. 
The committee urged tech companies to pay for and publicize online content monitoring activities and called on the British government to strengthen laws related to the publication of such material. Last year, I worked with Senators Burr, Rubio, and Nelson to introduce a bill to require tech companies to report terrorist activity on their platforms to law enforcement. What do you advise? Um, the provision, we modeled it after an existing law which requires tech companies to notify authorities about cases of child pornography, but does not require companies to monitor any user, subscriber, or customer. Um, I plan to reintroduce the provision in separate legislation. So here are two questions. Would the FBI benefit from knowing when technology companies see terrorist plotting and other illegal activity online? Yes. Would the FBI be willing to work with the Judiciary Committee going forward on this provision? Yes, Senator. I don't know it well enough to offer you a view, but we'd be happy to work with you on it. Well, I, I was so struck when uh, San Bernardino happened and um, you made overtures to allow that device to be opened and then the FBI had to spend $900,000 to hack it open. And as I subsequently learned of some of the reason for it, there were good reasons to get into that device. And the concern I have is that once people have been killed in a terrorist attack and there may be other DNA, there may be other messages that lead an investigative agency to believe that there are others out there, isn't it to the for the protection of the public that one would want to be able to see if a device could be opened? And I've had a very hard time. I've, tried, I've gone out, I've tried to talk to the tech companies, they're in my state. Um, one, Facebook um, was very good and understood the problem, but most do not. Has the FBI ever talked with the tech companies about this need in particular? Yes, Senator. We've had a lot of conversations, and as I said earlier, there, in my sense, they've been getting more productive because I think the tech companies have come to see the darkness a little bit more. My, my concern was privacy is really important, but I might, that they didn't see the public safety costs. I think they're starting to see that better. And what, what nobody wants to have happen is something terrible happen in the United States and it be connected to the, our inability to access information with lawful authority. That we ought to have the conversations before that happens, and the companies more and more get that, uh, I, I think, over the last year and a half. And, but it's vital. We weren't picking on Apple in the San Bernardino case. Right. There were real reasons why we need to get into that device. And, and that is true in case after case after case, which is why we have to figure out a way to optimize those two things, privacy and public safety. Well, to be candid, my understanding about some of this was that the European community had special concerns about privacy and that some of the companies in our country were concerned, well, they would lose business. That European concern is changing. I think what I read about the UK, what I understand is happening in France and Germany, increased sharing of intelligence. The realization, I think, that they have um, very dangerous people in large numbers, um, possibly plotting at any given time to uh, uh, carry out an attack, has had some palliative effect. And there may be a change of viewpoint. So it would be very helpful if our law enforcement community could help us. And this is not to monitor. This is something that's very basic. If there is a piece of evidence that says, hey, there may be a cell, there may be another individual out there, you have a chance of getting into that piece of evidence to see if that's true. All right, with a judge's permission. 
With the judge's permission, that's correct. So I thank you for that. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, we, we, Senator Lee hasn't had first round, so I got to go to Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Comey, for being here today, and thanks for your service to our country. Um, I want to talk to you about something raised by one of my colleagues a little while ago about electronic communications transaction records. Would it be fair to say that electronic communications transaction records include such things as uh, browsing history, uh, one's history of websites that uh, one might have visited on the Internet? Yes. Would it be fair to say also that what one views, what pages one has visited, m might in some ways be indicative of what one is reading? Potentially, you're right. Even if you don't have...